Okay, so we've got the Alenko DR605 on the bench. This is the one that has it has UHF transmit, but does not transmit on VHF. Um, sorry for the handwork with the camera, but uh, what I normally mount my camera to is that boom that the microscope's attached to. And I currently need the microscope, and I'll be using that actually here in a second to show you. Um, diagnostics was fairly simple on this one. These use power modules. Let me just unplug this microphone real quick. So there are two power modules in this. There's one under this shield, and there was would normally be one mounted right here, which is down here underneath the microscope. Okay, there's the cover that I took off of it. Now, of course, these are not designed to be repaired. I think this is about the third, uh, second or third, somewhere. It's not the first one I've done. This, this is either the second or I think it's actually the third one I've done. But uh, I've seen these going bad. The other ones I've did, done weren't in Alenko's. They were in, I think, Kenwood's. Um, same exact power module. It was a S-AV17. Um, but I believe that was in Kenwood's, the other ones that I did. Uh, but anyhow, so what goes wrong with these critters? Well, and I don't want to move it because now we're going to be looking at it in the microscope. You can see it's a ceramic style circuit board with all the components on it. Okay? So let me pause this, and this is going to be tricky. I know people, I got to get a, a real microscope camera. <laughs> uh, I actually have my other microscope. This, this one's on a swing arm. Actually, I like this one. It's just so fast for me to use. It's actually a dental <laughs> microscope. And I really love the pivot arm. Swings out of the way. I can, you know, move this thing anywhere. I can, you know, move it three feet up in the air if I need to, or down to the floor, quite literally. It swings in every direction. But, uh, uh, yeah, the other microscope that I've got is a, uh, is a, has provisions for a, a microscope camera. I just need to get a camera. <laughs> I really need to get my ass in gear, especially if I'm going to start filming stuff like this where you need to show stuff with a microscope. But I tried it, and it does work. So if I hold the camera up to one of the eyepieces, and I get the angle, you know, moving this camera back and forth, up and down like this, I can get it just right to where you can see what I want to show. And what it is, the circuit board is cracked. And then I'll show you, once I get, get this videoed, I'll actually mount the camera again so it's not bouncing around, that I'll show you, I'll measure it with an ohmmeter so I can so show you it is actually broken. So let's see if we can get this. Let me pause it. And then I'll get it in position and restart it. Okay. I gotta be real careful not to. Ah, and I just moved. But right there, where you see those three little lines, there and down here, the circuit board is actually cracked and the traces are broken at those right there, there, and there. Those three spots, it's broken. So, let me pause again, get the camera back into a mount. Okay, so now that we're back in the mount, and the camera's not shimmying all over the damn place, <laughs> but I really wanted to show that under a microscope, because it just does not show up. It's almost impossible to see with the naked eye. I mean, I'm looking at it, and I'm good at seeing stuff like that, and man, that's just, it's, it's not there. But it's right there, there, and there. There's a little crack in there. Almost, like I say, invisible to the naked eye, but that's that's the whole problem. And I've, I think the other ones, I think one of the last ones I did, it was actually split here. Um, and I think the other one had a split up here. So I'm not sure if it's just manual. I don't want to say defect because, you know, a defect usually means there was a problem with just this module. It seems to be an ongoing problem with these uh, Toshiba modules. Um this ceramic substrate breaking so yeah but it's fixable <laughs> that's the nice thing because if we look at this it's just you know a little path here so all I need to do and um, I found the easiest way when I did the other ones was I'll take my uh, desoldering tool I'll pull this solder off of it I'll actually take a, a piece of very thin wire and I'll basically make because like I say it's cracked right through that the S, this S, actually, that's exactly what it looks like, an S right there. I need to make a little bridge around that S 
Uh, now I could just re-solder that and it would work, but it would not be as reliable as if I also reinforced that with a small piece of wire. So like I say, I'm going to build that up just a little bit. Now you don't want to get hog wild crazy. You know, they've got all these bends in here. You know, I'm sure, um, Mark, if you're watching, I'm sure you could uh, bring an engineering, engineer's or point of view into this. Um, you know, what exactly purpose these serve. I'm sure there's a, you know, almost looks like an SWR bridge, but that's not what it is. But I'm sure there's an inductive or capacitance reason that they do these specific little bends in these things. But yeah, like I say, this is seems to be an ongoing problem with these. But like I say, they can be fixed. So let me get this cleaned up and uh, see if I can get that repaired, get it back in the radio, and we'll see if we can get some power out of this monster. Okay, so here we are almost back together. I left the cover off of the power module and the shield that goes over top of it. So anything left to install. I just wanted to show that the module that I just fixed is what is in the radio. So a second here to focus. And grab a non-metallic pointer. Okay, so here's the S-Bend trace that I fixed, and then under further inspection of this, the board was also cracked from here the whole way down through this pad on this capacitor right here. So this has all, all been repaired as well. And it does work now. So it's been reinstalled. See, there's new heat sink grease under there. And like I say, this just, <laughs> I guess, poor... I don't know. I just don't like these power modules like this with these ceramic boards, you know, stuck to the to the big metal heat sink. The slightest bit of warping, this stuff just has no give and they crack. And this one's a perfect example. It had cracked here and cracked here. So, yeah. And of course, it cracks at the thinnest point. You know, it doesn't crack in these big wide areas. It always cracks. You know, like I say, I've seen here before, and like I say, it was like, can't remember what rig that was, but it was there were Kenwoods that I've done these before. But yeah, like I say, it always picks the this thinner areas of these boards that they split. But a uh, little bit of determination, and anything can be fixed. So we have it hooked up to the communications test set over there, which, as you can see, right now is putting out a 159 megahertz signal. Actually, very low. I got it down, Christ, at what? 0.17 microvolts. Let's bump the amplitude up. One microvolt or 100, minus 107 dBm. Okay. Okay. And so this is the band it was not transmitting on before. And let's just switch over to. Well, actually, you can receive both, so let me just change the frequency over to 4... Oh, I got it on there. 443. Okay. And there's 443. So, if we transmit in the... Okay, see so we're transmitting 443. We'll switch over to 159 megahertz. And there we're at 159 megahertz. So she is repaired. Well, like I say, they can be fixed. It's just very, very, very hard. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. You need a, a hot soldering iron. Um, because with this ceramic board stuck to a heat sink, even out of the radio, you know, sitting on the bench, as soon as your soldering iron hits that, if you've got your temperature turned down at normal soldering temperature, your soldering iron just became a permanent fixture on top of this board because <laughs> it will get stuck on there. Um, you have to almost turn your tip temperature up to like 900 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 or whatever the hell that works. I turn the damn, uh, I'm not a Celsius guy, 
too much other shit to remember. Uh, let's see here. Reach down here and I'm going to crank it up. See what this thing maxes out at. Okay, 900 degrees Fahrenheit is 482 degrees Celsius. So, yeah, really friggin' hot. And you know, another problem with that is once you get your soldering iron temperature up that high, it starts to burn the solder off of the soldering iron tip. So you actually, it oxidizes so fast that it's hard to get solder to stick to your soldering iron then. But yeah, it's a, like I say, it can be a battle doing these. Um, the main key here is flux. Now, don't flood the whole damn board because you definitely don't want to get any alcohol up here on these. And, of course, that's what these fluxes are, uh, the liquid fluxes are thinned with is, is isopropyl alcohol because this kind of a glue, it, this is actually kind of like a rubbery substance that they seal these because these are actually the transistors. You can actually see the internals of the transistors. You're actually looking at the, you know, the heart of them. Unlike a, you know, if this was a regular you know, plastic molded transistor, this is what you would see inside of it. So, you know, they don't do that with these. But, uh, like I say, it's, you really need a high t tip temperature. But like I say, just make a little, take a little piece of wire. This is exactly what I did. I took, matter of fact, this little piece of wire right here. And I made my little, actually I came up here, down, over, down, over, down, over, and up. So this is all one... You know, and just bend, bent it up with a pair of tweezers and tacked it down. But like I say, a lot of liquid flux on there. Every time you touch the tip to it, it's going to, you know, burn that flux off. But like I say, it's keep just keep applying flux, come back down, and just a tiny bit of solder on your soldering iron with a lot of flux. That'll help that solder flow down onto the board. Because the last thing you want to do is overload the tip of your soldering iron with solder. Because when you bring it down onto this board, you're going to have a huge blob on here. And it is going to be a nightmare to get off. Because like I say, this board sucks the heat out of your iron the instant it touches it. So just a little bit of solder, lots of flux, just let it flow out. You know, you might have to, you know, come in, do a little piece, do another little part of it, another little part. Another, I mean, I probably had to solder this, you know, in five or six different stages to get it to look like that. And, you know... This is a really wide tray, so this one I could use a wider tip, but this one here, you know, I was stuck using a very small tip, so I didn't have a lot of thermal mass for, like I say, this one was easier, because like I say, this is, I could just stick a really wide chisel tip on there, but uh, all I got to do is pop the little cover back on there, and reinstall the shield. Oh, actually, I got to take the screws back out. Eh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it might help, but uh, yep, so there you go. There's a repaired Toshiba S-AV17 power mod, VHF power module. Um, now, I do still have to do this cord, and actually, turn this off. You'll notice, <laughs> just so it didn't split any more before I got any farther, I put a uh, zip tie on here to prevent this outer jacket from splitting back any farther. So I'm going to do a separate video on how to install these plugs. So that's the next thing to do once I get this radio buttoned up. I'll uh, crack this thing open and you know get this cut off, and we'll get a new new jack or plug installed on the end of this. So look for that video, and uh, like I say, that'll be separate.